Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of, you can call it a Tomorrow's Headlines today because this is something that will be in the news uh, not too far from now. Uh, it's something that's going to be a very big topic that's discussed throughout the world, so I feel like it's something that we should talk about. And one of the things that I'm asked often is, what about demons? Where do demons come from? And a lot of people think that demons are fallen angels, but they're not. Other people think. Other people say, "Well, it says in the book of Enoch that demons are the disembodied spirits of the of the giants or whatever, right? Of course, of and they or they'll say they're the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, but not using extra biblical texts and extra biblical sources. Can we prove that with the Bible? That's my number one issue with the book of Enoch, the book of Giants, the book of Jasher, and all that stuff that is mentioned in the Bible, but when you actually read the transcripts that they have, it, there are inaccuracies, especially like the uh, the book of uh, Jasher, where there's just uh, very poor, poorly written out like timelines and time frames, like the math doesn't add up, it's not there. Um, there's things in the book of Enoch that aren't biblical, uh, like Noah being born, uh, being able to speak fully and having its shining light so bright that he terrified his parents and that he and his wife were giants. They weren't giants. They were normal people. Uh, <laughs> how do I know? Because the Egyptians weren't, gi weren't gigantic and they were his grandchildren, you know? So... Hmm, just saying, uh, none of the people in the Middle East in the time of Abraham and such were giants. They were normal-sized people. People would be like, oh, well, this and that and all this other stuff. All right, so let me roll the intro, and then hopefully I've whetted y'all's appetite. Uh, you like my Talid over here? I'm using the Talid to filter light out. Um, it's uh, Talid, Talid slash um, my uh, microphone boom arm keeping the light out. Now I need something similar for over here so I can keep this light out and actually have good lighting. It looks ridiculous, but who cares? It's got a good message on it if you can read Hebrew. <laughs> All right, so let's just roll the Tomorrow's Headlines Today intro and we'll hop into this. Okay, welcome back. You caught me checking my phone. Hello, shalom to Yuvo and everybody else. <laughs> so we're going to cover this. All right. You'll probably hear some background noise. The babysitter's here. Uh, you got the Instapot going. Uh, Brooke is doing the dogs and stuff, and the dogs are barking outside. So background noise, get used to it if you're not familiar. And now my air conditioner decided it wants to come on. So background noise, get used to it. If you're not used to us yet, you know that we do life we don't work around everybody sleeping anymore. We just do life, period. Uh, it used to be I would get so frustrated by all the background noise that I would just want all of it to stop. Because, you know, to some people it's distracting. Like if there's a high-pitched noise or something. But you know what? It's life. We got to do what we got to do. The content's got to get out. So, I mean, someday if we're doing this like professionally in a studio, whatever, we'll do that. But for now, that doesn't matter. So... Let's do the origin of demons. Let me scroll this across the screen here. If you would like to help support us, partner with us, tie to us, sow into this ministry or whatever. We feed the homeless in our area. We put clothes on people's back. We pay people's rent. We buy people's groceries. We pay for people's car repairs. Um, we pay for single moms that have diapers, families that are in need, uh, single dads, uh, etc. You know, whatever we have to do, we like to employ people who need uh, help or assistance and, and help them out and share the gospel and, and give people the opportunity to work on their own schedule and still uh, do what they feel God is calling them to do. So all of that is stuff that we do if you'd like to be a part of that. First, Lord, this message always has interference when I do this. So, Lord, I declare right now that you block all of the interference, that you put ministering spirits up on the roof right now so that they will intercede and protect our signal so that we have full strength signal the entire time. And God, genuinely, from the bottom of my heart to the top of my heart, from the bottom of my toes to the top of my head, if I've sinned against you in any way, and you know I have, and you know what I've done, and some of the things I don't know what I've done, Lord, but I ask for your forgiveness and that you wash me in the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to pretend like I'm perfect, but I'm trying. So, Lord... Thank you for your forgiveness. 
wash me in the blood of Jesus. Amen. I give you permission to speak through me, share any revelation that needs to be said, and use me, work through me, and please let me get out of the way so that you will not have to work around me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, so this is coming from the book. This is chapter 8, page 81 on my PDF version. I don't know what it's going to look like when it's printed. It'll probably still be page 81, but anyway. So in the previous seven chapters, I had established that there were hybrids all around the world. Okay. Uh, now that I've established that, uh, they were found across the entire world, let's talk about why they would be demons now. All right. Now, the hybrids are Rephaim. In case you're wondering, they are hybrid giants that have mixed their DNA with things that are not human. All right. Now, I'm going to make this. Um, there's one major premise on which I'll base my the, this chapter, and this is my hypothesis, if you will. All demons are the disembodied spirits of the giants. The Anakim, the Rephaim, or any other name that's used to describe the Giborim, um, that's used to describe these hybrid humans. Again, they are not the fallen angels. As much as you want to think that they are, they are not. And I can hear it now. Uh, all humans that die go to heaven or hell. There is no in-between. You would think that that was entirely the case, but Scripture shows us that Satan's not in hell. And yet it says that the rest of the angels that fell are chained in hell. You should also consider that hybrids are not fully human. They're actually part beast. All right? Now when we look at Matthew eight twenty eight through 29, we read, When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? What would that be in Hebrew if they were saying that? It would be Yeshua ben Elohim, ben Ha Elohim. Yeshua ben Ha Elohim. Notice he's a human there. If it was Aramaic that they were speaking, it would be Yesh, Yeshu, I believe it would be Yeshu or Yeshua, bin Elohim, <laughs> which would still mean Yeshu, son of the gods. Yeshu ben benech ha Elohim. Have you come to torment us before the time? It is interesting that even the demons can identify the benech ha Elohim, and they did not call humans benech ha Elohim. They did not call themselves benech ha Elohim. They know better. It's just us Christians that don't seem to know better. First, let's look at one subtle thing the demons said, all right, that often gets overlooked. They said, have you come to torment us before the time? The Greek word used for time here is kairos, and this word means happening at exactly the right or most opportune time. And this seems meaningless, um, and as though it's just kind of trivial banter, but they're actually asking Jesus if he is going to sin against God and torment them. So, in a sense, they're accusing him of doing something that's outside of God's will, which would be accusing him of sin. Now, the word for torment here means to be tortured, or to be tossed to and fro like a wave that travels in a circular, buffeting manner. So, this is evidence that they do know what their fate is going to be, because this is paralleling Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. Just take note that Satan, the beast, and the false prophet which there's there's three it's the dragon the antichrist it's the ophis archaeus which means the original serpent the draconta the dragon and satan are bound up and thrown into hell now here in this verse it says the devil who deceived them was thrown into the hell into hell where the beast because remember they received the mark of the beast and um the false prophet who was the one that caused everyone to get the mark was thrown into hell. So this very clearly establishes to us that the dragon, the uh, that that verse in Revelation 12 where it says the dragon, the ancient serpent who was called um, Hasatan. If we're gonna, there's a whole chapter about this. But if you take that and actually read that for what it is, and then parallel it with Revelation verse 20, and you see that the dragon. The serpent from the beginning and Satan are all three different beings. And yet people read that scripture in Revelation 12 as though it's talking about one being. But here we have it. It's in plain English for you to see. All right. 
The same words here is used in Matthew 8 for torment is used here in Revelation 20. The demons know that the, that what their fate is. Somehow, the book of Revelation is not a surprise to them. That means that they have been ministered to and prophesied to as to what their fate will be. And since these are the disembodied sp spirits from before the flood, which we learned from 1 Peter, that would tell me that it was most likely Enoch and Noah that told them what was going to happen. Okay? And, and if you read the book of Enoch, which I have now, um, you would see that that was the case. Now, there's things in the book of Enoch that are right and there are things that are wrong. There, there are so many things that are wrong that that's why it didn't make it into the Canaan. People say, well, it was in there 500 years ago. Yeah, and they took it out because they got smart and got educated and said, wait a second, if Enoch was alive before Israel was a nation, then Enoch could not say to himself, in the land of Dan looking to Lebanon, which are two countries or a state of Israel and a country that didn't exist for another 1,500 years or 1,000 years or whatever after the flood. So you see, we got things like that that don't line up, okay? So you have to pick through and find the things that are accurate and that you can find in the Bible, okay? And this is why I don't typically quote or read these as though Enoch is canonical, um, uh, something that I can base a canonical doctrine off of, because it's not. But if I can find it in the Bible, then I will reference that. So I believe that's why there's so many mentions and references to it in the Bible, but that it's not fully in there. The parts that they referenced were definitely divinely inspired, but some of it I don't think is. Some of it I think is either soul or demonic, but nevertheless, I digress. So we see in 2 Peter 2, 4, as mentioned above, the angels are already chained in hell, all right, with chains of gloomy darkness, and there's no mention of any angels being loosed from any chains except in Revelations 9, 14, when apparently, and when we, I say apparently because I don't know for sure yet, only four angels that are bound under the Euphrates River are loosed to destroy one-third of the population. Now, currently, with our population being around 9 billion people, that would be, uh, I think at the time I wrote this, it was a little over 7 billion or 8 billion people. That's how long I've been working on this. But that would be approximately 2.3 to 3.3 billion inhabitants of the Earth that would be eradicated just at the loosing of these angels. Think of that. 3 billion people. World War II had a few hundred million and that was devastating, okay? Imagine what 3 billion people, what that, what a war like that looks like, okay? Now, this is carried out and found more clearly in Genesis 14 when we see the various names and descriptions of the Rephaites, which are Rephaim in Hebrew. Now, we've got the Zuzumites. In Hebrew, it's Hazuzim, which means beast. Um, and it's derived from the word as, meaning goats. So it literally means goat beast man in Hebrew. Have you ever seen any demons that look like goat men? Because I actually have. Kevin Zadai has. I heard him talk about it recently in one of his coffee talks. It's called Baphomet. Baphomet is a Hazuzim. And it's a god. It's not Baal. It's Baphomet. Okay? So... We have the terrors, which are called the Ha'amim. These are the terrors that are being spoken about in uh, Rev, uh, Psalm 91, where it says the terror by night, or when it's talking about the terror by night in different scriptures, that's talking about these Ha'amim spirits. They're terrible spirits. Um, then it has the builders, the Kiriathim, and then it has the cave dwellers, who are the Horites, who built homes inside caves and crevices, like a serpent burrows into a wall or or rock. Okay, then you had the builders who built these awesome, great big megalithic structures. And we know that they were building these amazing st structures and that they started to leave the Levant, and the Levant means white or pure. Um, I think uh, in Hebrew the word for white is Levant or Levant. Uh, I, I, I believe it's Levant. Um they started to flee this land, and you have Baalbek in Africa, which I think in, in Libya or one of those countries in, in western, northwestern Africa, um, that has a rock on it and says, uh, this is in dedication to all the, or something like that, those of us who fled from Yeshua, son of, or from, yeah, from Yeshua, son of Nun, the destroyer or the robber, right? So they actually left the Levant, which is uh, the Middle Eastern area, it's Israel, where they went and took over, which was the land of Canaan, and they went and still built more of these megalithic structures. 
And that's where those megalithic structures come from. People are like, how do we do this? Well, it tells it actually tells us. I cover this in the chapter of Nimrod. The Bible actually tells us how they did it. Think about this. Mizraim is Egypt. Mizraim was an uncle of Nimrod, which means Egypt existed when Nimrod was born. And they said, let us build a pyramid. If you do the research on this, in Hebrew it says, let us build a pyramidal shaped tower, Migdala, that sends a team or crew of people to space, to the heavens, to Hashemayim. And, there, and then we'll seal the bricks with uh, bitumen. Now, the word for bricks in that particular scripture is uh, Le Laban something or other, but it comes from the word uh, Laban, which is the word for white, like I just talked about, right? And so there are white bricks that are in a pyramidal shape that were made, burned, and then sealed with bitumen. Well, uh, when I was doing this, I thought to myself, I wonder what the pyramid looked like before it was as deteriorated as it is. And guess what? They believe that it was white polished stone, sandstone, I believe, that was sealed, and they found evidence of this, that in between the, the bricks was actually sealed with bitumen. Why bitumen? Waterproof. They were sending people into space. That's a pause for you to really let that sink in just as something for you to go read the book uh buy the book which i think um or we're just waiting on our um uh publisher to send us the stuff and we're going to put it up for pre-sale here uh probably april 1st in case you're wondering so getting back on track we're talking about the book of revelation and torments now second peter 2 4 the angels are already chained in hell 2.3 billion inhabitants of the earth are going to be destroyed and then we were talking about the horites the cave dwellers and and you know i shared this with la marzulli in an interview uh several four four or five years ago um about how the he had just discovered the uh, Ferema, Ma uh, Ferema Magnum was in located in a place that was genetically too far forward for it to be human, um, which means that the skull had to be very strong and that they had long necks. And they found out that the eyeballs, and this is in like on the trail of Nephilim 6, so I'll make sure I tag him in the bottom here. So you can go to lamarzuli.com backslash streaming, I think it is, or lamarzuli.net backslash streaming, and you can watch this. But he had studies done, showed that these beasts... Um, these creatures, whatever you want to call them, these giants, he calls them Nephilim, I call them, yeah, but um, they had Mediterranean DNA, red hair, their eyes were 33% larger than a regular human eye, and that meant that they could see in the dark, and these bones were found in caves. Now, where are these creatures hiding out today? They're hiding in caves, they're hiding in mountains, in caves, under the, under the earth. That's it, they didn't leave, they just went underground. They were already underground. They modified themselves to be underground, right? So I told him, hey, the, those could be the bones of Horites. And so he went and did research on it and did a lot of research and then eventually said, I believe these were Horites. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Um, so those who built their dwellings in caves and on mountainsides are seen in North America as well as in the land of Canaan. There's a city in Derinkuyu, Turkey that dates back 4,000 years. Guess when 4,000 years was? 4,016 years ago was believed to be when the Tower of Babel was begun under construction. So Derinkuyu, Turkey was built underground in the same area that Nimrod was taking over as part of his empire. He was actually reclaiming that empire. It was his father's empire first. Who was his father? <laughs> Go look it up. All right. <laughs> I say that, but you should know who Nimrod's father was. Okay. Uh, in Peru, there's skeletons of giants that have been discovered with long necks and eyes that are approximately one-third larger than human eyes, indicating they could see at night in the dark. All of that was discovered by none other than L.A. Marzulli with his diligent research into the obfuscated history of the world. Another theory that people like to speculate about is that the current land of the Canaanites is inhabited by the actual original Canaanite people who settled there. But scripture teaches us that Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, and the Middle East were occupied by the Rephaim hybrids. 
Deuteronomy 2, 10 through 12 states, the Amim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants like the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Amim, terrible, horrible, terrifying people. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esu dispossessed them and destroyed them, destroyed from before them and dwelt in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Okay. Now, as stated previously, a large portion of the mummies and skeletons that have been found in this area have been found to have red hair going back 4,000 years ago, or even 4,100 years ago. Isu was a redhead. One mummy of one of the original pharaohs was discovered to be a redhead with white skin. In Corral, Peru, which was built approximately 4,000 years ago, the city very much mirrors the pyramidal structures seen in Egypt at that time that were constructed during Nimrod's time period. And that the same, which incidentally happens to be the same same time period that the, the Great Pyramids of Giza were built. And have you noticed that all around, all over the world, there's pyramids built everywhere. They have taken pictures on Mars of pyramids that were built, statues that were fallen, sphinx faces that were fallen. Is it any wonder why? And they were trying to reach the heavens. Well, what? Who is Mars named after? Mars, the god of war. Where, what is Mars a derivation of? Marduk, the uh, the Sumerian god Marduk. Who is Marduk? Marduk was Gilgamesh de deified. Who's Gilgamesh? He's Nimrod. Nimrod's uncle was Egypt. Mizraim. Starting to click. Is it starting to click here? There's even speculation that a sizable number of people that inhabited the Middle East were white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Nordic-looking people called the Ammonites. And this actually, the Ammonites are mentioned all the way from Eastern, uh, Western Europe all the way into Asia. Think about that. They're called the Ammonites. And if you were delving into that tangent, you would discover a race of beings that are Ammonites also who are called the Aryans that are the basis for Hitler's Holocaust. Now, that's a whole other rabbit hole because that'll lead you down to Admiral Byrd and all that stuff, and you, you don't want to go down there. There's no evidence of what Admiral Byrd said except for the fact that there is a ton of UFO sightings in Antarctica at that base, and nobody goes to that base. You get a sign there. All right, now, as you get closer and closer to the Fertile Crescent, you notice that there is increased reference to ancient technology that existed in the days of Nimrod. Now, as these civilizations developed, they branched out westward and eastward, which is the depiction of the dispersion of the tribes in Genesis 12, uh, Genesis 10 through 11. Psalm 91 refers to demonic forces that cannot harm you under the shadow of God's wings. And it says, you will not worry about an attack of demonic forces at night, nor have to fear a spirit of darkness coming against you. Psalm 91 verse 5, the Passion Translation. And it also says in Exodus 23, verse 27, that this is the NIV version, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. The word used for terror here is imati, which is the same variant of the word used to describe the Amim giants in Genesis 14, 6. Interestingly, the word used in Genesis 14, 6, specifically used in Job as well. It is drawn and comes out of the body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terrors come upon him. It says, essentially what this is saying is when a person dies, these demons come upon them. They, they pounce on you, kind of like the movie Ghost, where those demons come up out of hell and pull that guy down into the pit. All right. The word is very specifically amim. These terrors, or the terror by night, are the ha-amim spirits. Now, each of these different tribes of hybrids def descended from Ham, the son of Noah. Ham's son Canaan was cursed by Noah after Ham sinned against him a year after the flood. This sin that was committed was, all right, I'm going to give you a trigger warning here. If you have kids, close their ears and get them out. I'm going to count to three, and then, or from three down, and then you can take over, okay? Three, two, one. One. <laughs> okay, so um, 
the sin that was committed against Noah by Ham was an incestual rape, right? And now I'll reshare some of that scripture, and I, I talked about this before, but I'm going to reiterate this to remind you, um, the reader, of what was previously shown about seeing their nakedness in the time of Noah. The Hebraic language had a very polite way of saying roofied or date-raped or to have sex with in the time of Moses. The phrase they used was to look upon their nakedness. You see this in Leviticus 18.7, which more accurately translates today to read, Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations to your mother. She is your mother. Don't have relations with her. <laughs> to me, that's like a, a duh, hello statement. But nevertheless, with the way people are getting addicted to pornography and stuff, this is an issue that's rising up again. <laughs> And it's just, you're seeing it more and more and more and more, and it's quite disgusting. Just a sign of how close we are to these end days, okay? Now, in Hebrew it says, Do not look upon the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother, for she is your mother. Do not look at her naked, she is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Now Habakkuk paints a picture for us by saying, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle even to make him drunk, that you may look upon his nakedness. Habakkuk 2.15 Now in this light, you can easily see why Noah was enraged when he woke up from his drunken stupor and then cursed Canaan, his fourth grandson, from Ham after the flood. The reason for this is important. It's because this is where sin and defilement started to creep back into the seed of man again. This was not where the giants came from, resulting in the second incursion of hybrid giants, but it was how the enemy was able to start to attack humankind in the future. Canaan was the great-grandson of Noah and the grandson of Ham. Ham's children were evil, and there's no mention that Ham ever repented of raping his father. Without repentance, the children are left vulnerable to the generational curse as a result of this sin. This also left them susceptible to sin and demonic influence because Ham was not righteous and did not teach his children to be righteous. Some have conjectured that either Noah or his wife were part hybrid, but remember Genesis 6-9 says that Noah was blameless in his generations. The word translated as blameless means complete, untouched, unblemished, pure, whole, intact, perfect, and without de defect. When it says that Noah was blameless, it indicates that he was in no way mixed with the hybrids genetically. He was spotless, complete, intact, pure, and perfect in his genetic uh, decomposition. Give me one second here. Okay. Okay. Now, again, if either Noah or his wife were hybrids, all of humanity today would be hybrids. If Noah was a hybrid, then you and I would be hybrids because we are descended from them directly. And, of course, we're descended from Noah also. All right. We would all be hybrids. All right. If Noah was a hybrid, I would be a hybrid. You would be a hybrid. And we wouldn't be able to be saved, which we know is not true. The hybrids are always noted as being evil, wicked, practicing evil, totally hating God. They also have identifying markers like extra rows of teeth, extremely tall height, extra fingers or toes, long necks, which is the word Anakim, beast-like characteristics, and so on. And actually, the ones before the flood were even more beast. They were just all kinds of messed up. They had arms coming out of weird places. Uh, um, let's say a triceratops had quills like a porcupine. Um, it had horns. It was mixed with a dragon. They were just It was just mixing everything, mixing, mixing, mixing in different ways. Um, so, moving forward here, every, everything was being mixed. It, it was nasty. Now, they managed to control that when they started to alter DNA to where they could start to make themselves retain somewhat human resemblance. And that's where these creatures come from. If you look, do any of the research on EBOs um, and stuff like that and the, the DNA that they found from these EBOs, um, you would find out that they say, oh, all of their DNA is exactly what we have on Earth, except there's one strand of DNA that we can't recognize. Well, that's because it's dragon DNA. <laughs> it's literally from the beast. That's the beast DNA. It's not human DNA. It's beast. Because they can identify the human DNA. They can identify the insects and such, but they can't identify the dragon DNA because we don't have the, the dragon. And then they know that this is dragon DNA. But that's what they use to, to graft. That's what they use because that's the original primal serpent that's the ophis archaeus is what it says in greek all right so 
God refers to the hybrids as being corrupted after he says Noah is blameless, and the word for corrupt means spoiled. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth, Genesis 6.12. Now in the Hebrew translation it says, and God looked. Now this is using the plural form, form of God, that's the word Elohim, God's tr three, Trinity. Elohim looked on the earth, and indeed it was corrupted, for it had corrupted all flesh and their way on the earth. Take note that God declared all flesh was corrupt, and their way or walk in life was corrupt as well. If he was only referring to the people being wicked in their heart, then he had no reason to identify that their flesh had been corrupted or spoiled. Now, if you look at the genealogical line of Ham, you'll notice factions that occurred where flesh had been corrupted and produced hybrids again. The most obvious are the Cushites, Mizraim, the Egyptians, Fut, and Canaan. Um, you could say Fut or Put. I would say Fut. Um, they were not born hybrids. They made themselves that way. First, you have Mizraim, or Egypt. The rulers of the Egyptian people believed that they were descended from the gods, little case G. Today, we laugh this off as just a human superstition, yet as biblical Christians, we believe God can manifest as a human child with no father in a virgin. Now, that's not too far-fetched for us to believe, but, oh, uh, they're descended from the gods. <laughs> that's just silly superstition. That's just myths. There is something to it. No, they're not descended from actual gods. <laughs> Sometimes I have to stop myself from saying things that would be offensive to people, but I'm going to say this, but Lord, help me to say it a proper way. No human being today or ever has had intercourse with a spirit in the flesh. Okay? Now, what goes on in hell, that's a completely different story. That's not the kingdom of God. All right, now, anyway, listen to this. Let me show you the biblical evidence that the Egyptian people produced hybrid. Egypt was the father of the Ludites, the Anamites, the Lechabites, the Naphtuhites, the Pathrusites, the Kalus, uh, Kosluhites, from whom the Philistines came, and the Kaphtorites. Goliath was a giant hybrid, and he was descended from the line of Mizraim, a son of Anak, Anakim a descendant of the Kaphtorites. Moses took special effort to point out that some of the descendants of the Philistines were of the line of Egypt. So when people say, oh, free Palestine, free Palestine, we're the original Palestinians. You are not. You are not the original Palestinians. You are occupiers. That's what you are. Because the original Palestinians were hybrids. Are y'all giants? Six fingers, six toed, red haired giants? Nah, you're not. So that right there, hogwash, mishigash. Okay? The uh, descendants of the Kaphirites. Moses made it a point to, to point this out. All right? So, you Palestinians, which is literally comes from the word Philistine, it was created as a way to mock the Jews because their rivals in the past had been Philistines, okay, which is what um, Anakim came from, is what Goliath came from, okay? N now listen here. This gives us evidence of the hybridization of humans was happening in the days of Nimrod. Nimrod was a son of Cush and was a mighty man, Hagiborim. That word used for mighty man is, again, Gibor. Gibor being, obviously, uh, and, and today, the Hag the Hagiborum, uh, I think, means friends. But back then, it, it meant mighty men, okay? It's the same word used to describe the children of the sons of God in Genesis 6-4. When Moses says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards. Stop. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore them children. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Since we know that the Philistines had giants in their line, and they were descendants of Egypt, Mizraim, we could look at the oldest mummies of the Egyptians and get a sense of what their earliest ancestors may have looked like. And the oldest mummies discovered didn't appear to be hybrid. They were normal. They were normal-looking. Normal-looking human uh, slash name Mazor, which is where we get the word Mizraim, is plural, Mitzra. It's the root of the Hebraic word for Mazer, which means to bind or bandage. 
because they named their kids prophetically back then. They named them based on what they looked like, what they did, uh, etc., or what would be going on in their lives. And what are the Egyptians known for? Wrapping, binding, bandaging. I mean, darn, they even came up with the um, uh, sutures and stitches where they would actually clamp the skin together and tie it down. They would use thorns, put thorns through your flesh like this, long ways on either side, and they would take and put a uh, thread around those and pull that thread tight until your flesh was healed, and then they'd pull the thorns out. They came up with antibiotics through their 3.5% alcohol that they were getting hammered off of, apparently. All right? So, they looked very normal. They were bandaged or bound their dead in linen wraps. Now, one thing that's shown as a similar trait among the Egyptians is that many of their depictions of the gods and the pharaohs have long heads, elongated skulls, or they're wearing hats that make it look like elongated. The reason they did this was because it was representative or an homage to the original progenitors of Egypt. If you were going to Google the earliest Egyptian mummies that they have found and dig around a little bit, look at the pictures of the oldest mummies ever found, you would see that they had two traits, red hair and elongated skulls. Some of these Egyptian mummies are housed in the British Museum in, e in England. As far as elongated skulls go, you can look at the hieroglyphs of the ancient Egyptians and note that Pharaoh Khufu's statues and burial mask, which his mummy just suddenly disappeared with no evidence of it anymore, uh, all of a sudden it's gone, and there was no record of it, and nobody got in trouble. Anyway, uh, if you look at Khufu's statues and burial masks, he is noted as having an extremely elongated skull. Now, the reason that I made mention of this is because of Ham's son, Put, whose descendants aren't mentioned in the Bible. I've speculated that Put and Mizraim may have been twins because Mizraim is plural in the Hebraic language. This indicates that there was more than one. None of the other children were given plural names at that point. At the very least, they might have shared some common similarities. Now, the um, Egyptians actually refer to uh, Put as the Puntites, a variant of the Futites, uh, Putites uh, in some of their ancient annals, and many believe that they lived in an area now known as Somalia. However, Josephus and Pliny the Elder both placed Put as being in the land of Libya and westward. Whoa, what's west of Libya? That's weird. Huh. You, now we're about to get a little bit crazy, as if this whole thing hasn't been crazy and hasn't been paradigm-shaking to you already, all right? I would like to refer you back to Genesis 14, verse 5 through 7. The passage of Scripture discusses the first mention of the Rephaim. The word Rephaim, R-E-P-I-M, A-I-M, is derived from the root word Rapha, Rofa. Rofa means doctor today um, in Hebrew, and also because it means healer. Uh, one who heals, right? However, when used to describe the race of hybrids, it actually means giants, shades, or ghosts, or the forsaken, meaning no redemption. Forsaken. Again, you see the same word used to describe the inhabitants in the land of the dead in Proverbs 2.18. It says, for, the, for, her, for her house sinks down to death, Sheol, and her ways to the land of the departed spirits. The word used for de departed spirits here is, you guessed it, Rephaim, the land of the Rephaim. Now let's look at a verse from Isaiah 14, 9. Sheol from beneath is excited over you to meet you when you come. It arouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. That's the New American Standard uh, Bible, 1995. If you were to read this verse in Hebrew, it would say, Sheol below quivers for you. They come against you at your arrival. It stirs up all the Rephaim. All the chiefs stand up from their thrones on earth. All the kings of the nations, and they all testify to you, saying, You have become weak, just like we are. Now, there's something that you may want to consider for a moment, is that the spirits of the Rephaim, what we call demons today, are completely aware that they are weak, and yet people are afraid of them. Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus is completely defeat, has completely defeated those very rulers, the deceased spirits of the Rephaim, that in Isaiah 14 admitted that they are weak. You're like, oh, they're powerful. They're powerful. They're not powerful. You know what's powerful? God. He who lives in me, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, lives in me. You know what? where it doesn't live? doesn't live in those demon spirits. 
Isaiah 14 is the first mention of Ephesians 6.12 spiritual hierarchy. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word used for ruler in Greek is arche, meaning ruler, chief, magistrate, or king. The kings stand up from their thrones to meet him in Sheol. You see what I'm saying? This is giving us a clearer understanding of what we're dealing with in the spirit realm. That's not enough scripture to show that the Rephaim are the spirits of the dead, so we're going to go deeper into this. Now I'm going to show you some different scriptures to really drive home the point that these spirits are actually demons. All right. When I was a young Christian, I believed that all the gods that existed and were worshipped in the ancient days were fallen angels. That was when I was first a Christian. I mean, logically, the description of certain types of angels describes the appearance of these gods. But that wasn't enough for me. I started to notice that the Bible differentiated between fallen angels and gods very specifically. And I learned that the word used to describe... The only time it says the god of this world is Satan. That's the only one it's used to describe that of. Isn't that interesting? But the little g gods get a different name. All right. So uh, I learned that the word used to describe God in creation was Elohim, which is the plural word for God. So thus I concluded that this was a revelation of the Trinity. However... This same word could be used to mean the gods, as in the idols, or even human beings. We have several examples of this in Psalms. For example, Psalm 82, 1, a psalm of Asaph. God presides in the divine assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. This says in Hebrew, God takes his stand in the middle of the congregation of gods. He judges the Elohim, the gods. Well, we know from John 10, 34 through 36 that the Elohim that God was judging in this passage were not angels, but they were human beings. Jesus answered them and said, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods, he meaning God, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say you of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said, I am the Benecha Elohim. And you know, when he said, I am the Benecha Elohim, he had to say, Yaben Elohim. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So he had to use the name of God to say he was the son of God. And they were really mad about that. So the next example we see is the word El used to refer to demons in Exodus 15, 11. It says, who among the gods, Ba Elim, Ba Elim, okay? is like you, Jehovah, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. And that was my own emphasis that I added there. Another scripture in which you see demons mentioned as El is Psalm 77, 13. The verse translates Elohim. This is a reference to the Trinity. Holy is your way. What God, lowercase g, El, is so great as our holy Elohim, as our gods. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, God calls himself Elohim. They say, oh, so it's a majestic plural. It's the majestic plural. Okay, apparently the majestic plural is a pronoun these days. Anyway, upon discovering this revelation, it was highlighted to me by the Holy Spirit that the spirit that's reported to have entered Saul was allowed to come on Saul by God departing. But a few verses later, Samuel notes that the spirit came on Saul to torment him from Elohim. And it says here, this is the Berean study Bible, or Berean scripture. After the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, a spirit of distress from the Lord began to torment him. 1 Samuel 16, 14. This scripture confused me so much, and I thought it showed that God could have an evil spirit. And people use this in their, their whole um, uh, predestination theology and that God is responsible for good and evil and all this stuff, right? That's wrong. That's all Calvinist mindset. It's wrong. It actually stems from Gnostic mindset. But anyway, um, I thought that God sent an evil spirit, but that's not the case. The spirit that is sent by Jehovah was a sign. The word translated as from God in this verse is ma ma'ot, ma'et. And this word is tricky. Ma is a prefix in Hebrew that means what, why, where of, or how. Et is the Hebrew word ot, and it means a sign, marker, or signal, beacon, omen, or evidence. So reading the passage with this revelation shows us that the demon was sent as a sign of God's spirit turning from Saul, or his face turning from Saul. If the spirit of God is not with you, which means he has turned from you, then the spirit of the enemy can come upon you. Now, 
allow me to elaborate this assertion, okay? In Hebrews, it doesn't say the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. It says the Spirit of the Lord, Sarah, or turned from Saul. Whenever it says in the Bible that the Spirit of the Lord departed in English, it actually says the Spirit turned from him. And that people ask this question a lot. I've heard it often. How can God be around us all the time and yet a spirit can lift off of us? How is that possible if he's everywhere? He can't lift off of us. That would mean he could not be somewhere. I see it. I felt it just now. It clicked in somebody's head. I saw literally a bright light go off. Ding. And I said, he just turns from you. He's still right here in your face. But now he's turned his head a little bit. And that's what it means when it says he will not look upon sin. He turns his face from you. Essentially, it's like saying he's turned his back to you. He's still aware of what you're doing. So he turned from. That is also true with the Greek explanation as well. We know that the Spirit was allowed to come up, come upon Saul. And then in verse 23, we see that Samuel notes the Spirit was a rea, ruach, an evil spirit of the Elohim. And so it was, and that's the lower G gods, little lower lowercase g gods. And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Now, we commonly think of the word Elohim as only meaning God, as in big G God. But with this revelation that you now have, you see that the Elohim was the lowercase g gods. That can mean evil gods or idols also. So, and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. When we look at this verse in Hebrew, it says, And came the spirit from Jehovah, distressing Shaul. It doesn't say that the distressing spirit came from Jehovah. What was going on in this verse was that the demon, a demon had come upon Saul when he was being tormented in 1 Samuel 16. Uh, it came and went from Saul. Okay, The literal word, words used in Hebrew here are Vetachai ruach Jehovah rea. And the spirit from Jehovah came distressing El Shaul upon Saul. Al Shaul. Okay? David played the harp, which ushered in the spirit of Jehovah. And Jehovah's spirit then distressed Saul. You see? So he tried to kill David as a result. Why? Demons don't like to be in the presence of God's manifest spirit. And Saul was clearly demonized after the spirit of God turned from him in his disobedience. And that spirit would come and go, which allowed this evil spirit to come upon him. And that spirit was what was distressed when David ushered in the Ruach Yehovah, the spirit of Yehovah. This evil spirit of the gods that came on Saul, the evil spirit of the Elohim, was a spirit of a departed Rephaim. In my opinion, I believe that this demon may have been the spirit of Goliath that David had slain. It was angry that David had killed him, and it wanted vengeance. This is my own conjecture. It's not a fact or something to create a doctrine over. It's just my own idea. In Psalm 96, 5, we read, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The word used for idols in this scripture is el lim, and the word for gods is, in this case is singular el the Bible very clearly defines that the gods of this world are idols. A side note, this same word can also mean worthless, good for nothing, coming to nothing, or of no value. Now you may be wondering, how does this correlate to the spirits of the dead Rephaim being the demons that we know today? So let's explore a little more. All right, The word for idols is not only elim. That was a word that came later on in Hebrew. There is another word for idol that was commonly overlooked. It, used to, it was used in the older uh, Hebrew languages and the, the more proto-Semitic uh, version when we if we don't research the original Hebrew words um, that were in scripture we could completely overlook this there's a reason that those words were used and placed there it was for our benefit so that we are left without excuse on the day of judgment and you can see that in Romans 120 um, one of the alternative or earliest words for the word idol in Hebrew was found in Genesis 31, 19. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the idols 
that were her father's, or the images that were her father's. The word used for idols here is Raphaim. T, R-A-P-I-M. The T is silent in this word. So it would be pronounced the Raphaim. The gods that Laban and Rachel worshipped were Raphaim, the spirits of the dead hybrids, the Raphaim in Genesis 14. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? It's also interesting to notice that we see this word used several times to represent idols, but one in particular that stands out to me is King David's wife, Michael, Michael, Michal, however you want to say it, worshipped idols. That was Saul's daughter, Michal. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, an image, and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth, 1 Samuel 19, 13. We see this word used again here in Zechariah 10, too, except this time it's the spirits of the Raphaim are personified. For the idols speak delusion, and it's the word Raphaim. The Raphaim speak delusion. The diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. So it says the idols speak delusion, and then the diviners have lies and false dreams. Why? Because the demons are speaking. They come in comfort. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. So we see here these idols, these Raphaim, speak. Do demons speak? Yes, they do. Since we know that the spirits of the Raphaim are demons, we can now understand who or what is speaking through a person when they are demonized. For instance, Jesus was confronted by the legion of demons, Mark 5, 2. We talked about it uh, at the uh, Gesserinis, right, when he got off the boat. Mark 5, 2 describes it as an, as an unclean spirit when they, when they saw Jesus. They cried out and spoke through the man in whom they were staying. You may be thinking, but there's scripture that says the idols are mute and can't hear. Psalms 115, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 12, 2. And you're correct, in a sense. But the type of idols that they're talking about are the actual wood and stone idols that can't speak. They're not referring to the spirits that do, because when they enter into those idols, then the idols do actually speak. But it's actually the demon speaking through that particular piece of rock. Now, I remember listening a long time ago to the late Reinhard Bonnke telling a story of when he was in some foreign country and he asked a priest at the temple of one of their gods something about how the stones were powerless. And the priest responded and said, yes, the stones are powerless until the spirit of the gods enter into them. Then the stones come to life. Yeah, so deceptive, isn't it? Here we have all the evidence that demons are not fallen angels, even though it says that Satan took one-third of the stars with him. That does not mean that these were angels, these stars that he took with him. In Amos and Acts, the demons Molech and Raphain, or Raphan, sure look a lot like the words Raphaim, right? And that's an interesting thing that you learn from Aramaic, because Raphan, or Raphaim, was uh, Aramaic, and Elohim was what became Elohim in Aramaic. So if you take Raphaim and you you take and pluralize that into Aramaic, it would be Raphan, Raphaim, Raphaim. So it literally means Raphaim. That's what that's talking about. And those names are associated with stars. Stars is a word that's used in the Old Testament and the New Testament interchangeably to represent Jesus, demons, the people of Israel, and angels. Now, is it a far stretch to assume that those stars he took with him, uh, to me, it's a far stretch to assume that those stars he took with him were actually angels. Since the fallen angels were already chained in gloomy darkness, however, the Raphaim have not been judged yet as we established from the account of the demon-possessed man that met Jesus on the shore of the Gadarenes. They said, have you come to torment us before the time? Now, I'm going to wrap it up by saying this, all right? I want to give you hope, and I want to empower and equip you for the total victory that we've been given through Jesus Christ. And hopefully this has really uh, helped you and, and sparked some questions, which I want your questions in the comments, please. I want to hear them. I want to read them, okay? If demons are just... Uh, Demons are just the dead, hybrid, half-breed, human-animal, DNA-tainted spirits of the giants that were defeated by men throughout the Old Testament before the cross. 
So how much greater of a victory must you have now over them who were utterly defeated by Jesus? Now we have God. We don't just have our own physical strength to defeat them, which they did with their own physical strength, with stones and spears. They defeated them with stones and spears. We have guns and we have God. <laughs> we have angels on our side. It says here, uh, this passage in Jeremiah 10.5, I like it. It says, like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. Jeremiah paints a picture telling us we have no reason to be afraid of demons. They can't move on their own. They need you to carry them and take them places. And what Jeremiah is referencing here is that the actual statues themselves can't walk because they're inanimate objects. But by the same token, I believe that on a deeper level, this is showing that demons only have the ability to impact your life through the actions of others or through your actions. This is probably why they call a witchcraft a work of the flesh and not a work of the spirit. So if it was just a work of the spirit, they could do whatever they wanted to. But they have to get you to work in the flesh. And it says here, Now the works of flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such alike. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. So, the demons that are manipulating forces behind, the, behind these acts are trying to get a person to act out these works because it's what they did in their previous lives. Do not yield to these demons anymore. They are completely defeated. All they want is to try to disqualify you from receiving blessings from God. If they can keep you returning to some kind of blatant sin, they can prevent you from receiving. Paul teaches us, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So you have to have the Spirit of God to discern this stuff. These demons were defeated before Jesus came, and they are now utterly defeated because of the finished work of the cross. Now when I say defeated before he came, I mean in the physical they were defeated, and then Jesus came and defeated them physically and spiritually. They may try to get you to think that they can do things by telling you things like, you have cancer, you're sick, or something asinine like that, which just doesn't line up with the word of God because it gives them liberty to attack you. So you have to come into agreement with them for them to attack you. So come out of agreement with them and into an agreement with God, and then you will have rendered them completely powerless and be using that victory that Jesus has 